evening, everybody. My name is Ganesh Taylor, and I'm your host this evening for the debate about the time of our lives. Being is found in the present, for the moment of consciousness is all there is, or so Zen Buddhist philosophy teaches. The moment of experience has also been central to Western philosophy since Descartes, and the value of the now currently fashionable from London to LA. Yet, as Marx argued, is not the point of life to change it for the better and not simply to contemplate it? Does only the present exist and is embracing the present the path to truth and fulfillment? Or is this a dangerous fantasy and the present an illusion, a distraction from the real task of creating the future? Or can we give an account of time that explains the uniqueness of the present and the sea of time that surrounds us? This evening, uh, we are joined by three uh, illustrious speakers. First of all, we have Sarah Jaffe, who is a journalist, columnist and podcast co-host covering the politics of power from the workplace to the streets. She was one of the first reporters to cover Occupy and the fight for $15 and has appeared on numerous radio and television programs. She's also the author of the acclaimed books, Work Won't Love You Back, and Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. Secondly, we're also joined by poet and philosopher John Petch, uh, who holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Georgia. His dissertation explores why Gilles Deleuze, Henri Bergson, and G.W. Leibniz all intertwine continuity with heterogeneity, whether considering how a life dissipates time or a body diffuses force. His ongoing research dances between philosophy, maths, and art, and he has published several works of anomalous poetry. Welcome, John. Last, but absolutely by no means least, uh, Ron Purser is a management professor at San Francisco State University, a Zen priest, and a cultural critic whose viral article, Beyond McMindfulness, opened the floodgates for the mindfulness backlash. He is the author of eight books, including the widely discussed Mindfulness, How Mindfulness Became the New Capitalist Spirituality, and his works center on the challenges of introducing Buddhist thoughts into modern individualist, secular, Western consumer capitalism. What a rip-roaring lineup we have there. So, uh, without any further ado, I want to um, let you all uh, give me your three-minute pitches uh, addressing the following question. Is the present moment all that exists and is it all that matters? Ron, you're up first. What do you think? Um, not in the way we think. I would argue that what we have on offer is a very narrow conception of the present moment within a particular understanding of time that's based on a linear temporal order and what we call reality or existence is located, so-called located in this ephemeral and momentary present, but it's continuously changing as the next moment always arrives. So on the one hand, I would argue that there really is no present moment. It's a mental construct, perhaps even just a label. And it's problematic, I think, to believe that the present is all that matters for a number of reasons. For example, the popular practice of mindfulness exhorts us to be mindful and attentive to the present moment, but the idea is that we would be less stressed and happier if we only could stop ruminating about the past or the future and just drop into this pristine present moment. However, I think if we looked more closely, we would see that such an activity presupposes a subject who is already deficient in some way where the task is somehow to pin down this mental object to grab hold of what amounts to kind of an elusive and perpetual moving target, I, I, think we would, I think we would discover rather quickly that what we call the present moment has already shifted. It's becoming the past. So even the act of trying to pay attention itself requires time or duration. So by the time such attention occurs, the moment labeled as the pre presence already passed away. So in a way, it's kind of like a futile task, like chasing a, after a, a mirage in a, in a desert. And so I think that's problematic. And just one point about Zen is that um, 
I don't think Zen really says anything or offer us anything conceptually about the present moment or about consciousness. It may point at what we might think of as timelessness or the infinitude of being, but pointing isn't the same thing. And our modern, our modern understanding of the present is very different from this more timeless now, because that timeless now is completely non-dual, completely non-conceptual. So I think what we have on offer here, I hate to sound crude, is a very cheap uh, counterfeit kind of present momentism or here and nowism, where the present's turned into kind of like a fetish. And you could bring Marx into the equation because Marx talks about fetishes that sort of, where people sort of irrationally have reverence for something. And the present moments become like the, the modern grail. Uh, it's very fashionable, uh, but it's really not new. We can go back to the gurus in the 1970s, such as Ram Dass's book, uh, Be, Here, Be Here Now, and more recently, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. Uh, but I think what's common here is that the the present moments become sort of imbued with some sort of magical power uh, that if we just live in the present moment all will su supposedly be well very interesting all right well thank you for kicking us off there ron um john what what do you what do you think so i would say no not at all is the present all that exists and i would kind of agree with some of the points ron was making as well but i think i would phrase it very differently and maybe try to open up some differences between us. Um, I like, Ron, how you were saying that the present is more complex than it's usually accounted for. It's not a simple thing at all, but it's this already kind of structured thing that we're kind of interfacing with all the time. Um, so I would say that, right, the present is not all that exists and the present is thereby not the most important thing, but not because time is some kind of an illusion or a mental construct or anything of that kind, or even like a kind of cultural hallucination or something like that. It's because the present is the kind of least consequential part of this vast kind of, you could say, durative structure. I'm using the, the word durative from the notion of duration and things enduring. Um, and it's kind of less the pat, or sorry, it's less the present that matters because you have this vast seething past that's always kind of informing and in, informing the present and insisting uh, on acting in different ways within the present. And so because you have to, inter because everything has a certain kind of past that determines what it is and how it continues to unfold in time that you can never reduce everything to the present. And nor can you make the present a kind of merely mental construct of some kind, but it is in a real sense, the way that things take time involves the kind of past that they've had. And that, is part of who and what they are and how they differentiate themselves from other things. So we always have to kind of inner, we always have to deal with the past and we always, we always have to confront the different ways that things take times and the long histories that inform different things. Do you think uh, that that's all that matters? Is do that I think that, the well, okay. So I do think that how things take time is in a certain way, all that matters. It's as Henri Bergson, a philosopher that I love says, it's, kind of the most substantial thing of all, even more substantial than kind of a thing's material or bodily presence in a certain way. So I do think that time and the way things take time is fundamental in a very real way. Uh, but I don't think, again, that taking time is reducible to, to present time taking. Interesting. Sarah, what, what are your thoughts? Is it all that exists? Uh, I'm not a philosopher, um, but I... The thing that I thought of and, and sort of got annoyed by this question, because it's impossible to live in the present if you are constantly worrying about where your next meal or rent check is coming from, if you're paying off debts from your past and terrified of being evicted in the future. And so, um, yeah, that just before I opened Zoom to sign on for this panel, I was reading a New York Times article about a bill in the state of California that would require Amazon and other warehouse employers to disclose their productivity quotas that in order to make sure that labor law that you know requires things like bathroom breaks was being upheld. And in the story, there was this line, I quote, an Amazon official raised concerns that some employees would abuse more generous allotments of time for using the bathroom. So yeah, 
um, that's a perfect illustration of the fact that for so much of many of our, most of our adult lives, our time is actually not our own. And so the sort of admonitions, and as Ron noted, that are often now these days coming from inside the company to be mindful and live in the present um, are another way of controlling that time. So the first thing that, of course, comes to my mind then is working time. And the hours that we spend on the clock are essentially um, already given up. And depending on where you work, how much control you have over that time, um, if you're in an Amazon warehouse, as noted, it's incredibly, incredibly structured. And how long you get to pee is literally taken into account when they decide whether they're going to fire you or not. So when we're thinking about time as a thing that we measure as a society, that in itself sort of comes into most people's lives as part of capitalist work discipline. Um, I spent the afternoon reading E.P. Thompson on the introduction of basically time discipline and fun things like, um, you know, the way that the clock was an ob uh, itself an object of struggle in a lot of workplaces, um, that the fight for a shorter working day, which Marx writes about, which many people write about, was central to the concerns of workers for the last several hundred years um, you know, back to the 1700s. And um, I, I loved this line from Thompson. He said, the first generation of factory workers were taught by their masters the importance of time. The second generation formed their short time committees in the 10 hour movement. The third generation struck for overtime or time and a half. They had accepted the categories of their employers and learned to fight back within them. They had learned their lesson that time is money only too well. And I think looking forward to the future, because um, I guess that's what I'm talking about here. It is fascinating that once again, after the pandemic, which skewed, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, everybody's perception of time in so many weird ways, we are talking once again about shorter working hours and people are working around organizing around shortening the working week once again. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.